after three and a half years of itinerant ministry from the backwater of Galilee, through a few Gentile lands and now in Judea, Jesus has come to his final destination in Jerusalem. We have been studying through Mark's fast-paced travel docudrama of the life of Jesus, but it has been slowing down this last week of his life, and there's been much more detail. And today, we come to the account of his death. It is hard, yet holy ground that we come to today. Throughout our journey through this book, we have seen how Jesus had showed himself over and over and over again to be a most unexpected king, have we not? He preaches the good news, he heals the sick, he confronts the wicked, and most of all, he loves his people. And now, he will lay his very life down. Do you remember Jesus' words from Mark chapter 10, verse 45? For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It was the end for which he came. And that is our title today. And it is unfolding exactly as he told his disciples three times before. Do you all remember? We studied these passages. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. Mark 9, 31. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Thirdly, Mark 10, 33. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So it is coming to be just as he told them. How have we arrived to this part of the story? Remember, Jesus has now been betrayed by Judas and he's now been abandoned by his disciples. He has been tried under cover of darkness by this kangaroo court of religious leaders and they're barraging him with false charges. He answers none of them, but to the question that they asked, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? He directly answers and he asserts in no uncertain terms, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So in a rage, these leaders carry him over to Pilate because only the Roman government could put someone to death. Under Pilate's examination, Jesus still offers no response, except to one question. He answers Pilate's question, are you the king of the Jews? And he answers it so ironically, because it's an ironic question, because he is. You have said so. You have said so. Makes me think of Isaiah chapter 53, and I would commend the reading of the entire chapter to you. Like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. What an unexpected king indeed. But the irony continues, and it is deep. This heathen governor Pilate demonstrates a better conscience than the religious leaders. He recognizes, oh, it's out of envy these guys brought him here. And he seeks to release him. But what happens? No, the chief priests go and stir up a mob, a mob of the people who just a week prior had been throwing down palm branches and exalting him as the son of David, the king of the Jews. But Pilate is not able to release him. The chief priests stir up this mob. They ask 
they, de- they get the mob to demand the release of instead Barabbas, as Peter preached last week, a notorious insurrectionist, a murderer. And instead, take Jesus, the innocent one, and crucify him. Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? This is the heathen governor asking them this question. But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So now we come to our passage today. And can I ask us, as I read this, I know normally we have the scripture up for you to read. This morning, can I ask you to close your eyes? This is hard. It's hard for us to stay intent and focused. I'd like you to close your eyes and stay intent. Listen carefully as I read the account. And imagine this awful, yet awe-filled scene unfolding. Mark chapter 15, verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him. Hail, king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, They stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled that says he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha ha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi. Lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. And when he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph, 
of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This family, this, this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of the cross. First Corinthians 1 says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. It's the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. But it is now being made known to us through Jesus and what he is doing. The storyline of the entire Bible peaks here. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John says in chapter 1, let us behold again this morning. Let's look carefully through this awful and yet awe-inspiring peak of Scripture. What does Mark intend for us to see? There are four gospel accounts, but this is Mark's account. What does Mark intend for us to see? I want us to look at the specific people and the details and the responses that this account gives us. They're going to be filled with mockery, irony, grief, wonder, and ultimately recognition and faith. So first, the soldiers. The soldiers led him inside, it says at the beginning, verse 16, and they called together the whole battalion. That's 600 men. So for frame of reference, we are about 200. So imagine two more of us gathered around and all of them brutal, hardened, familiar with violence and inflicting it. That's the setting. They clothed him in a purple robe to mock him because he was accused of being the king of the Jews. They crown him with thorns to mock him. They start to mock um, honor him. Hail king of the Jews. Struck, spit, knelt. Then they strip him, put his clothes back on him and take him out. It just says he, he, they compelled a passerby to carry the cross and it's easy to skip over this. Why did they have to do that? Before this account even started, Pilate first scourged him. Many victims of Roman scourging did not even survive the scourging. So he was already bloodied and weak. Again, Isaiah 53 says it's by his stripes. We are healed. He's suffering for us. So they compel a passerby. It's not an accident. What an honor for this man to carry Jesus' cross. Simon of Cyrene, and then it says, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why is that there? It's entirely possible that at the time when Peter and Mark were writing this gospel to the Roman Christian, the Christians in Rome, that Alexander and Rufus were there. It is an account that is meant to emphasize the historicity of this. And these guys know, go ask them. Then it says they brought him to Golgotha and they offered him wine mixed with myrrh. This is something of a, a, a dull painkiller. But it says Jesus didn't take it. No, he's going to keep his mental faculties, what's left of his physical capability. And he's going to feel everything. And then Mark just says, and they crucified him in verse 24. Why so little detail on the actual crucifixion? 
Doubtless, it was well known at the time. You know, Mark first addressed this to Christians, as I said, in Rome, who were suffering under Nero. They would have been very familiar with crucifixion. It was, crucifixion was utterly humiliating, degrading, um, agonizingly drawn out, and long. The Romans reserved it for their worst offenders. No question. And it would ultimately lead to death by shock or suffocation. It is shocking, no less, though, just the concept. This, we, we thought this was the king. He's so unexpected, and now he is on a cross? Now he is dying, and in, in, in this way? Still, it seems that Mark's intention in the way he accounts for this is to focus our, intention on the, our attention on the sacrifice as a whole, not so much the individual physical components, although those are significant. I don't want to minimize that at all. I've heard whole sermons given on the physical suffering of the cross, and I would commend them to you because we need our modern sensibilities to be affronted by that. But Mark is drawing our attention to the sacrifice as a whole. Family, when he was in the garden, this was what he was anticipating. It wasn't just the physical pain. It was the cup of God's wrath. It was the abandonment that's coming. It was the whole suffering in our place. So then in light of that, because Mark just simply says, and they crucified him, and he moves on, what detail the passage does give us takes on an elevated importance. The who and the what and how they responded. So right after that, we get this. They crucified him and they did what? Divided his garments among them, casting lots to see who got what. Psalm 22 says, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And then it says they posted an inscription of the charge against him. Again, so ironic on the top of the cross above his head. The king of the Jews, indeed. And they crucified two robbers on either side of him. It says in verse 27. Then we see passersby. People just walking by. Typically in the crucifixion, they would do it. The crucifixions would be done very, very publicly at crossroads where everyone could see. And the passersby, the text says, derided him, wagging their heads. And they specifically says what they said. You who said you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. What irony is this? Because we know what temple was he talking about? His body. It's doing it. He's doing exactly what they're saying. The chief priest, too, with the scribes, they also mock him. He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let Christ, the king of Israel, come down now from the cross. Both of these groups asking him, come down. Come down. He's not coming down. He's laying his life down. Even those crucified with him also reviled him. Psalm 22, verse 7. All who see me mock me. And then the count pivots in verse 33. And again, the pivot is around these time frames that get referenced. And it, again, it conveys to us, this is a historical account. This is not a story. It is history. He had been crucified, verse 25 said, at the third hour. That's 9 a.m., so remember, the kangaroo court was overnight. All of this happened overnight. The flogging, I don't know when before that, but the crucifixion was nine in the morning. Then it says, verse, uh, in verse 33, then from the sixth hour, from noon, till the ninth hour, 3 p.m., the middle of the day, there was darkness over the whole land. Darkness is a stark sign of the presence of God in judgment. In every gospel, all the events leading up to Jesus' death happen in the dark. And even now, at the point of his death, in the middle of the day, noon to three, 
there is supernatural darkness. Amos chapter 8, verse 9 says, On that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down and the, at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Then at the ninth hour, it says, Jesus cries out. And these are the only words of his that are recorded in this entire awful account. And they are grievous beyond measure. And he is quoting Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 reads, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Jesus would have been very familiar with this psalm. We all know something of what it is like to be alone, don't we? There's not a one of us in here that can't in some way describe an experience of loneliness. And for some of you, that might be acute and it might be very current. But no one in all human history has ever been alone like this. Why was Jesus forsaken by his Father God on the cross? Why? So we wouldn't have to be. It was with the end for which he came. Tim Keller says the judgment that should have fallen on us fell instead on Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For our sake, God, speaking of God, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Jesus embraced our life experience to the utter end. He embraced that forsakenness. So I just want to pause and say for all of us who have ever felt forsaken by God, and that is every single one of us, at some time in your life, and maybe even today, you feel that way. I'm speaking to you. For all of us who have felt that way or feel that way now, this spectacular sacrifice stands like a mighty, unbreakable rock against which every wave of the lie that you are forsaken crashes and breaks. Do you understand that? He was forsaken on our behalf. My God. There is much we don't understand about even his suffering here. How much we don't understand about our own suffering. But I understand this. If he forsook his son, he's not going to give me up. I may not understand what I'm struggling with or what we're dealing with or the suffering or the sickness or the can't get over the sin, relate, whatever it is. But he forsook his son. That tells me at least this. I am loved. You are loved. And there's nothing you can do to add to that. Amen. Then it just says the text in verse 37, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. There must have been so many questions. I mean, can, can we just, this is partly why I asked us to close our eyes and imagine. Because it's hard to imagine. Can you imagine what followers must have been thinking at this point? How unexpected doesn't get at it. Devastating. He was the king. We thought he did all these works, his words. What is happening? And now he's dead? The text mentions so many women, verse 40, 41, 47, and he names them. And again, this is historicity. They were there, go ask them. Mary Magdalene, twice. Mary, the mother of James, Salome. Notably absent in the account is the disciples. We know from 1450 that they had all fled. In John, we get an, a, at least one reference that um, the disciple John was there. But anyway, it's, it, it, the text is emphatic about the fact that the women were there. Now, granted, many women who followed him and ministered to him over his ministry, but it, it says in particular they were faithful observing, faithfully observing from a distance. From a distance. 
Nonetheless, eyewitnesses to this. And also at the end of the chapter, eyewitnesses to his burial. And then we have Joseph of Arimathea, who was also, it says, the text, looking in verse 43, for the, looking himself for the kingdom of God. Why does it say that? Because this man, even though he was on the council, he recognized that despite the mockery and the facetious inscription over his head on the cross, this was indeed the king. And the text says, he took courage to attend to Jesus' burial. And it says he did it, again, in a specific time frame, at the evening, the day of preparation. But this is very specific. It's not just a story. But like I said, all these followers must have had so many questions. What does this all mean? Doesn't it just seem senseless, wrong, a total defeat, a total loss? A total miscarriage of justice? Tim Keller notes that they would eventually see that they had been looking right at the greatest act of God's love, power, and justice in history. This was the end for which he came. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. What did Jesus do? He came to take our place. That substitution he took our place, the wrath we deserve, the punishment we deserve for our own sins, all the false charges like Peter was preaching to us last week. The false charges, Jesus didn't answer. Do you know why he didn't answer? Because he was taking on, they were charges that were legitimate for us. He took them on. I'm not opposing those. Yes, I'm becoming sin for you. That's substitution. That's taking our place. He took our place, but he did more than that. He opened the way to God. How do we know this? Because the text says in verse 38, what happens? He utters a cry, he breathes his last, and what happens next? And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. God himself responded. The curtain of the temple, we are unfamiliar with this, so let me just briefly. The temple worship was established in Leviticus. Go back and read Leviticus 16 in particular about this. The temple was a way for the people of God to interact with God without dying. The Ark of the Covenant and where God would be and where he interacted with the people was in this place called the Most Holy of Holies. And it was cordoned off inside the original tabernacle, which was a tent, by a curtain. So even when they moved into the Solomonic temple and had a permanent place, there was a holy of holies and it was cordoned by a curtain. This curtain was not like curtains today. It's a thick veil. Huge. I don't know how tall the temple was. I didn't look it up. This holy of holies was entered once a year by the high priest with a blood sacrifice to do one thing, to make atonement for the sins of the people. That's it. So when it says the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom, this access to God is now open. Amen. Jesus, the great high priest, has now once and for all entered to make atonement for us. Hebrews 9 tells us, by his own blood, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. God himself tears the curtain that had separated us as Christ's body was broken and torn for us. Jesus opened the way to God through his broken body, through his blood shed, which now cleanses us. Oh, oh, we can't talk about all of the implications. It's not enough time. Romans 5 says, through him we have also obtained access by faith 
into this grace in which we now stand. So, how are we to respond to all of this? It's compelling to me, having meditated on these verses for quite some time, that the way Mark accounts for the people that are involved and the responses as they interact, the mockery, the hatred, the following at a distance, the confusion, the wonder, the awe. But there is one more response that the account leads up to, and it is sharp, and it is absolutely clear. And it's recognition. Verse 39, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. This brutal, godless Roman centurion who was in that battalion in the praetorium who was at the cross, who was participating in the crucifixion, does what? He hears his cry. He sees how he died. And he responds, truly, this man was the son of God. I think this is the point of the text. The point is to lead us up to this response. And it's amazing to me that the response is from this man. There has been three times in the book of Mark, this is the third, that there was some measure of recognition of who Jesus was. But this is the first time that it was fully, he was fully recognized as the son of God. He states it very clearly. And for a Roman centurion whose allegiance was to the emperor of Rome, who was recognized as divine, that is an absolute statement of rejection of the worldly way and embracing. It's a, it's a statement of faith. Family and friends, I believe he was converted on the spot. <laughs> Through no merit of his own exemplifying that Jesus has substituted. He has taken our place. He has opened the way. And look who gets in. Are you kidding me? So I think this is what I want to draw us to. This man recognized Jesus for who he is. Do you recognize him for who he is? This is not just a story. It's history. Do you hear his cry? We weren't there. We're here now, but we're hearing it again. My God. Do you see how he died? We weren't there now, but we're, we're seeing it now, aren't we? I want to invite you. Look at him. Consider do you recognize him for who he is? Do you see the hope that is there? And then finally, I just want to invite us. I mentioned already the fact that Jesus is suffering and we don't understand and can't wrap our heads around that. I think there's such mercy in the fact that the account includes this. Faithful women observing from a distance so many questions. Even Joseph of Arimathea having to take courage to bury him. But it must have so many questions. Don't we? Aren't we at times inclined to be a bit at a distance? With so many questions. But the invitation could not be clear. Could it? The invitation to recognize who he is and put our trust and faith in him. Can I just invite you, if you have never done this, what would prevent you what, what other hope could there possibly be? Do, do, do you want to put your hope in your own work? This Roman centurion did not. That's a signal to us. That's a signpost to us. That's a hope to us. The invitation is open to each and every one. I don't care what your life story has been, how hard, how much failure. It doesn't matter. 
Jesus has made the way. He has taken your place. You or I don't deserve it. That is quite clear from the text. There's no mistaking that there's no deserving here. But it didn't prevent him at all from willingly laying his life down. He opened the way to God through his own torn flesh, through his blood shed for us. This is the end for which he came, to take our place as our substitute, to open the way to God who shows us his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was the end for which he came. Can I ask us to stand? We're going to respond in song, and then we're going to respond with communion.